everybody. Happy Sunday. It is Sunday, March 29, day something of our um, stay at home fun. Uh, welcome to Change the Shed and um, where we are going to get together and do some weaving, tapestry weaving, or if you're a spinner or a knitter, uh, go get your project and we will work together a little bit. Um, I just wanted to say, um, change the shed. If you want to share what you're doing, use that hashtag. It's in the top of your screen. Um, on Instagram, it's a new hashtag, it looks like. So we can take it over. And if you're on Instagram and you have an account, you can share what you're working on. In progress, finished, it doesn't matter. Leave us some comments about your thoughts and um, the size of the piece and the loom you're using. And um, that will be a really fun way to see what's going on. And if you're not on Instagram, Twitter, you can also use the hashtag on Twitter. And um, if you're on Ravelry, there's a fantastic tapestry weaving group on Ravelry just called Tapestry Weaving. So if you use Ravelry, if you're a knitter, you probably do. But there is a tapestry weaving group, so go there, and um, it's it's a, a wonderful place to connect with people. If you don't use Facebook or the other social medias, Ravelry is free, and it's a wonderful place to go. So um, I will look for all of you there with that hashtag, especially on Instagram. But um, thanks for sharing what you're doing. Hi, Jocelyn and Anne and Sally. Sally lives just down the road from me in Loveland. Hi, Ginny. I'm glad you're enjoying these. And Michelle, glad you all are showing up. And I hope you, um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> it's just phlegm. It's not, uh, I'm not sick. Uh, we can all weave a little bit. I have been um, realizing that there's a real underlying level of anxiety in myself, and I think we probably all have that. So the reason I want to do these things is just to encourage everybody to weave a little because I think it really helps with that anxiety, um, especially if, if we're stuck at home. There are some of us who might do better if we could go work in a hospital um, because adrenaline carries you through. So we're stuck at home. Let's do some weaving. And um, this week, I'm going to try hard to focus on one project at a time. I'm actually going to show you different projects this week on different looms, just so you can see some of the different looms I like to use. But um, I'm going to try hard to focus a little bit because I feel unfocused. And um, maybe I will actually finish a piece, perhaps this piece. I don't know. We'll see. Um, thank you all for coming. It looks like. You're here from all over. Devra from Phoenix. Hi, Sue from the UK. Windy UK. Um, Kathleen and Kate. The hashtag, Kate asked what the hashtag is, change the shed. You should see it right. For me, it looks like it's right here over my head. So um, hopefully you can see that. Um, day 15 of shelter in place in Northern California. You guys have had it longer than anybody. And um, I think that means that you all are also going to do well, better than some of the rest of us. So hang in there, Sheila. Good morning, Sarah and Nan, who Nan, by the way, in Woodstock, New York, you have the best handle. Um, anyway, Mandy and Audrey. And Harlan, thank you for everything. You, um, for all your comments, you guys, I hope it's helpful. Sherry and Grand Junction across the state. Uh, good morning, Harold and Sarah and Mary. Ah, near Madison. I'm the undergrad in um, Appleton, Wisconsin, Mary. It's, uh, Madison's a great town. Um, ooh, Missy says she's doing a bag on a box with her kids um, for um, ongoing tapestry stuff. That's great, Missy. Um, 
Sarah Sweat has a bag on a box um, project and she has, a, a, my brain is not working, um, a little um, instruction pamphlet that you can get that shows how to do it. But if you go to Sarah's website, which is a field guide to needlework.com or just Google Sarah Sweat, S-W-E-T-T, -T, you'll find the bag on a box. We want to hear how it goes um, with the bag on a box, Missy. That's awesome. Karen, back from Canada. Michelle. Sarah says, ooh, Missy, how exciting to make a, ba a box loom. Thanks. So um, Sarah is here this morning. Hi, Sarah. Here's what Sarah said. Um, so awesome. Make your loom. Let us know how it goes. What a great project. Um, see, now I want to do that. <laughs> Another day. Um, okay. So I have um, this loom going. And let me show you. So I'm going to show you this loom for at least one more day. And I'll show you again later. Whoops. I'm still playing with this technology, apparently. There we go. Um, let me move this so it's not in the way of the loom, maybe. Tell me if that, um, I moved the window for the what, where my face is. So if that's in the way of what I'm weaving, let me know. Uh, so let's just weave a little bit because I think I need to weave today. Um, yesterday, look, I worked on this some yesterday. Uh, not that you need to be proud of me, but um, I did a bunch of weaving yesterday and um, there's a little butterfly here that I want a dotted line to look, sort of look like he's flying and that's what this um, silk is. Not 100% sure that's what I'm gonna, gonna do, but um, so far I like it. We'll see how it goes. I've left the tails out just in case I changed my mind and I wanna take them out. Um, <laughs> Sarah, I'm going to add this again. Now I kind of want to make one too. A coffee filter yarn box? Why not, Sarah? Do it and we'll, we'll look at it. Mystic, Connecticut, Linda. When I was a kid, we went to visit Mystic Seaport. Very cool. Ah, uh, Karen from Sky. Something very romantic about that, Karen. We're glad you're here. And Sherry from California. So what I'm doing here is building up this um, color so that I can put in this line. Hopefully, yeah, I think you can see that. This will be eccentric again. And I'm still hatching. The challenge of this is that I'm still hatching these three colors together. And I want it to look like it goes from you know yellow down to a cream color. So while I'm creating that shape, I still have to do some hatching. And of course, a little bubbling. Oh, Linda, that's great. Linda says she's not weaving right now, but she is working on some new designs. I think that's fabulous. The more we can put our thoughts into actually making things, designs and weaving or sketching or whatever you like to do, I think the more it helps keep our mental health good. And I maintain that the better we feel, even if we sort of feel like we're extraneous to the larger, we're not making masks or um, running a respiratory department in a hospital. Um, I still think it's important that we make things and we can contribute by being there for other people and we can do that by staying calm ourselves yes jocelyn let's see i actually have a list here so that i make sure i answer your questions jocelyn is asking about the cutbacks again ah devra I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. Deborah says, I um, I um, fixed two wefts next to each other and I called it a flub or I did something where I um, 
the shed was wrong for just for two of the warps. And I think what I did yesterday, I'm not sure. I don't really remember, but I'd have to go back and look at the video. I think that I had a tail. So I'm sure I was building up a... God, what did I do yesterday? Maybe it was over here. I'm not sure. I was building something up and I had two... Um, the shed was right except for a couple warps. I think what I did, at least I did this at some point yesterday when I was weaving, is I pulled a tail from behind and just put it in the shed that was wrong to shift the shed. Just using, so I'm using three strands here. I often will take, if there's a little tail or something, or just another piece of yarn, like my table's always full of just single pieces of yarn. You can just, if the shed is wrong, in a spot. So if this shed were were wrong, which it isn't, but if this were just for those few warps, I could put in this in the other shed and the shedding is wrong. Keep in mind that, um, but I could put this, it's called a crapo, a crapo or a crapod, and then shift it back. And then these other butterflies would actually weave. You can also make a float on the back. Instead of doing that, you can float um, the butterfly and started in the opposite direction. There are just various ways to shift the shed. Um, oh, great. Summer, that's cool. Summer says she's watching us weave while she's making masks. You go, Summer. Um, we need all we can get. Yeah. Okay. Let me make a note, Kathy. And I'll talk about that in just a sec. Let me show you how to build this curve up though. And then I will answer some questions. Mostly because I'm feeling a little uptight today and I feel like if I weave for a few minutes, I will feel better. Probably need to go out for a walk soon. So here I'm building up this curve. That was a valley thread. I thought talked about valley and hill threads a little yesterday, but right here, I wonder if I do this, does that help? Here you can see there's a valley thread, which means that that will pack in more. And when I do this curve, it will be smoother. Buenos dias, Catalina. Where are you coming from? There was someone here from South America, Chile, yesterday, and I missed and I missed you. I missed the comment, and um, I saw it later. So it's wonderful to have people from all over the world. Oh, Nancy said she was watching this morning an eagle outside her window. That's amazing. That's a very good thing to sit still and watch. <laughs> so here I'm building up this curve more and more. Yes, Michelle asks, um, crapo as in, here, I'll put this up just so you can see the um, word. This is the word, crapo. It means toad in French. So yes, that is the word. Um, I don't know why, uh, but it does seem to be a word that people use when they talk about putting in this little bit of, my teacher, James Kohler, used to say it meant crap. <laughs> Sorry if you don't like the language there, but um, he, he frequently would say that, because it helps you remember. Um, I love toads, so that's nothing against toads. Uh, but the little piece of weft that you can use to shift the shed is a crapeau. Okay, so 
building that up. I'm still able to follow this line and keep the um, valley threads going. Eventually that will break down if as my line shifts. But here I'm going over by two by two by two. I do want it to look like a curve and not turn into a straight line. So pretty soon I'm going to have to curve that up a little bit. Costa Rica. Thank you, Carolina. So happy you're here. I agree, Sarah. Sarah says these update uptight days are hard. Weaving helps, especially if you focus on bubbling well, metaphorically also. I feel like this is building up a little bit here. So I'm going to, I'm also getting a little split in my warp, which I don't want. So when I come up here, I've actually, this is another place I've been fudging with this 16 EPI thing. Because this weft is so thin, I've been actually joining these slits by just bringing one of the thinner weft over here. You can still see where I did it. And I grabbed just one of those, one of those, let's see if you can see it there, warps to make a join. And then because this um, weft is so much fluffier, it covers it. I've been doing it this whole way. So right up here, I have to plan when I put this blue back in to do another one of those because this is starting to create a little bit of a split and I don't like that. Just an advantage of doing using this fluffy weft versus this really thin weft. I wouldn't do that if I was if the whole thing were at eight ends per inch, I wouldn't do that. But it seems to be working well for this. Yes, Kathleen's asking if I'm using different shades in this section. So there's three butterflies and they're each different. Let's see if I can. I have these three colors. So dark. So the one butterfly here on the edge is two of these and one of this middle cream. This one is three of this middle cream color. My camera can't focus that close, sorry. And then this one on the edge is three of this white, which is actually just the natural um, Harrisville Kohler single yarn. It's undyed and it's not bleached. So it's sort of a lighter cream color. So yeah, those three are different and I'm hatching. You can see here where the hatch lines come together. It's a little harder to see them here because the values are the same. Um, thank you, Catherine. That's really sweet. Um, I'm glad that it helps to be able to hook in a little bit to people who are a weaving community, I guess I would say. Oh, Angie, good. I'll show you that. Angie's asking about how I'm weaving the 16 EPI versus the 8 EPI. I'll, I'll show you anyway. I don't have it quite set up, but I can demo it. So um, Kathy asked about beaders. And she's talking about tapestry beaters. And um, let me just show you real quick. I don't have, let's see, I have another one here. Sorry. Okay, here's three I have uh, close at hand. Um, these two are by Magpie Woodworks. I really like them. This one is one you can get still today. This is an old one. Um, and the it's a little bit different now. The company was bought by um, Becky Dowd, who's an amazing woodworker. And this was made by the um, man who started the company, whose name was John. And um, both of them are fantastic woodworkers. They're made with dog comb teeth, which I love. They're really smooth metal teeth, and they're set really firmly in this wood. So um, this is the small one that uh, Becky makes now. And she has larger sizes, ones that are larger than this one, and even a really big one. And the website is magpiewoodworks.com. 
I like this little guy for smaller areas. And then this other one I'm using, I like this for little tiny areas. I've been using it a lot on this 16 EPI section. This is made by um, Threads Through Time. So T-H-R-U. So it's Threads Through T-H-R-U Time, T-I-M-E, on Etsy. And Barbara and her husband make... Um, lovely. I love the tiny ones, but they also make bigger ones and they're really um, quite beautiful. Again, same thing, dog comb teeth. They're set really firmly into the wood and they're really beautiful. So her shop is on Etsy. I really like the metal teeth. Um, there are other beaters with wooden teeth and those work fine too. The one thing I want to say, I had this question recently in a couple online classes. When you're picking the tines of the beater, I think that Threads Through Time makes one with like 14 times per inch. Um, and unless you're weaving, it would probably work here. Maybe, maybe not. It The thickness of the warp determines the width of these tines that you can use. So, um, ah, there we go. Um, if these tines, imagine if these were closer together and your warp is too thick to go between them, you won't be able to use the beater. So I like to have the tines between like seven and 10, and I wouldn't set them closer together because even if you're weaving with sewing thread as your warp, um, this kind of a beater will work. If you're using sewing thread as your warp, go ahead and get the 14 tines per inch, but in general, the wider ones are better. Okay, um, I do have a whole YouTube video about tapestry beaters if you um, search back a little bit. And there's probably a blog post about it too. Um, okay, so Kate and Angie are both asking about the 16 ends per inch section. Let's see if I can make my camera. I got a lot going on here. Let's see if I can make it so you can see it. So basically here, if I back it out, can you see this? No, I'm afraid to, let me see if I can move the camera. So here you can see that the shedding device, the heddles are on doubled warps. So the, all of the shedding device is set at eight ends per inch. And the coil, you can see the coil at the top, you can see that better. Sorry, that's my umbrella behind there, but um, actually I think I have a picture of that here. So this is what a Merix coil looks like. And if you can see the one at the top of my loom here, you can see that there's two warps in each of the little coil spaces. And, um, and each of the heddles here has um, two of those warps together. And so that's, it's huddled for the eight ends per inch section. So in the 16 ends per inch section, both Kate and Angie, I think are asking how I do that. I have to split the warps. You can even see they're spread out here because I've been weaving on this section. Um, I don't have huddles set up for that. So I showed yesterday how I was using, um, sometimes I use a double pointed knitting needle like this. So basically this is like an open shed rod, which you might use on a different kind of loom if you didn't have, if you had leashes or no shedding device. And this, I can open one shed really quickly like this. And then the other shed is opposite to that and I have to pick it. So you can see, maybe, I like to use the shed stick to pick the warps 16 EPI is too close to pick with your fingers, in my opinion, at least for my big fat fingers. So you can see here that I've picked the other shed. Um, so one of them is where this shed rod is and the other one I pick. For all of this section, I have to weave it that way. I can't, and I have the shed um, stick in neutral, the uh, shedding device in neutral. Um, this was warped, Kate was uh, um, asking if this was 12.6. It's not, it's 26. So it's the smallest size of cotton seine twine. Um, 
and I'm just split. I'm using them as one warp over here, and I'm using them um, two of them together as one warp over here and spread apart on the 16 API section. Oh, Karen says she feels like a heathen um, because she's currently using a fork. You shouldn't feel like a heathen at all, Karen. Um, there are people who use forks all the time, especially a nice heavy dinner fork or like an old, you could search um, antique stores for these, those older um, silver forks that are heavier. Those are great. Um, Kathy Todd Hooker takes a plain old fork and drills a hole in it and adds washers to the back for weight. So it's completely fine to use a regular dinner fork. I would look for one that has thinner tines and one that's a little bit heavier than like a, you want a good quality dinner fork, let's say, but you're all good with that. Go right ahead. Um, Kate, what do you mean by two packages? Um, that might be an autocorrect thing, but... Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, yes, Harlan says with 16 EPI, he's using a crochet hook to pull out the warp. So I have seen people use crochet hooks for that. And that's, to you know, whatever tools work, some tools are faster than others, but it's all good. So <laughs> Audrey asked if the foot will be at 16 or 8 EPI, definitely 16. Um, I haven't decided the color of the foot yet either, so we'll see how that goes. When you decrease, so Linda says, when you decrease the 16 EPI section, then do you pick up two warps manually? So I'm only doing the manual work where I'm doing the 16 EPI. That's where I'm picking them up, like I just showed with the shed stick. For the whole, these two sides are at 8 EPI, and for those I'm using the shedding device on the Merex um, because that's much easier and quicker. So the only place I'm doing it manually is these sections that are at 16 ends per inch. And I can put those sections wherever I want. When I get up here, these will spread out because I will pick them up like this and use them as 16 EPI. And the warp will look like this when I get up there. It's kind of magic, but it works great. Um, Oh, Ann says, pay attention. Ann is our, um, is my beloved OT backup. Um, she is, has much more experience in ergonomics than I do. Occupational therapist. I retired about six years ago. Um, and Ann has a lot more experience than me. So anyway, thank you, Ann. She says, here, I'll pop this up. She says, pay attention to how it feels in the hand. So that is, um, important just in terms of using the tool, but also kind of, um, you're going to use a tool that feels better. So pay attention to what you like. We're talking about beaters again. Um, I, I tend to hold the beater up, you know, up close to the top and I use a little wrist snap. Um, and so for me, the shape of this part of the beater doesn't matter as much, but if you weave in a way, a lot of Navajo weavers, for example, will hold their beater and work like this and then they'll just snap it forward. In that case, if you're working you know, on the weaving and then snapping your beater forward and not ever putting it down, you do want to make sure that it fits well into your hand. And there are lots of Navajo beaters that are specifically formed for that kind of holding. And if you like to do that or you want to experiment with it, look for one of those Navajo beaters. Most of the tines are wood, but they're shaped in a way that they're better to hold. Um, Uh, okay, Jocelyn, let me t uh, tell you about the cutback. Um, so I think you can see it here. Let's see if I can maybe move this a little bit. So on this section here, I'm doing what's called a cutback or a lazy line. And what that is, is this little thing. You can just see it. See how these warps are stepping back and then they go this way the the relay the place where the two wefts came together so I was weaving two 
wefts together and then apart. And they're just stepping over that place where they meet. It's, it's a very simple thing. I'm just making an angle, but the two colors I'm using are the same instead of different. And you can see it makes this little zigzag pattern. Um, I'm not doing cutbacks at all here. There's no cutbacks in this. This is just straight up weaving. Wherever I'm meeting and separating is random, so you don't see that line. A cutback is simply um, makes this diagonal line usually with two colors and often it's done because people are weaving on a large loom or um, Navajo weavers use it a lot. They use upright looms and if you're weaving on one section of the loom um, and you have sort of a background color, which they often do, uh, you don't want to weave, you can't, you have to have a line somewhere where you are stopping of the section you're weaving and to make that line diagonal works very well in tapestry. If you make it vertical, of course, you're going to see this vertical slit and you'll have to sew it or something. So to make the line diagonal is an, that can be filled in easily later. And that is the functional purpose of having a cut back. Sherry is asking why I would use a, the 26 um, sign, sign twine instead of the a fatter one. And it's simply because I don't want to have a fatter warp here. These are already getting fairly close together. And um, at 16 EPI for me, 12.6 is too fat. Some other people would actually use 12.6 at 16 EPI, but um, I want a thinner warp at the 16 EPI section. So I'm using a thinner warp and then doubled. It's very close to the size of like a 12.9 cotton seam twine. So on the wider parts, I'm still getting the size warp I want by doubling that thinner warp. Oh, Kate, okay. So um, as I'm warping, what Kate was asking, do I go over each dent twice in warping or do I have two different warp spools? So no, I don't have two warp spools. I'm just doubling, I'm going around um, as I'm warping and putting two warps in each of the coil dents. So um, this whole doubled set thing is a more complicated. I, I'm regretting a little bit bringing up the doubled set thing <laughs> in this project. I probably should have just started with a really simple tapestry, but I was trying to get this finished. Um, the doubled set thing I know is a lot to take in, and I don't want to get distracted from the fact that we just need to weave. Um, maybe I can do a whole YouTube video explaining how to do it at some point. Um, I don't have anything in the online classes about it either because I've really only done so, you know, three or four tapestries using this technique. Um, but I will in the future make um, some more content, I'm sure, about how to do it in one of the courses. Um, and I will mention, thanks, Anne, for bringing that up. I was talking about Anne, my ergonomics um, specialist, who is in the Facebook group, if you're in my Facebook group, which you have to be in one of my online classes to join the Facebook group. But if you're in there, Anne is doing um, ergonomics posts right now about weaving and ergonomics. And don't worry, I will save those. And I'm sure I'll talk Anne into doing some sort of a Maybe. I'll ask Ann if she'll do a guest post or something so we can gather together the best ergonomic tips and get them out there for everybody. Um, that's a good point, Linda. Linda Whiting, um, one last thing about beaters, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there are different ways to um, beat in your weft. And a lot of people use uh, bobbins. And so if you're, especially in upright looms, if you're using a bobbin, you're often tapping the warp in. So if this, what I mean the weft in, if this weft were on a bobbin, I would work, let me back this out just a little more so you can, sorry to fuss with the camera, but I want you to be able to see this. Um, so say I was a bobbin user and the, the actual thread was on this bobbin. Um, I might manage the weft the same way I normally do, but I would still having the bobbin in my hand, tap it in with the bobbin. 
And then a lot of Bobbin users actually are picking the shed. So they would um, pick that next shed, put it through, and pack it in. So a lot of people who weave this way also will then have a very heavy beater. This is another very common way to do it. Um, every so often they'll like whack away on the weaving with a heavy beater. That's a whole nother subject about how tight you want your fabric and how much you want it to pack in and all of that. But um, the way I'm showing is not the only way. Oh, good, Jocelyn. Yes, they're also called lazy lines. Lazy lines is a term I'm trying to get away from because um, it's offensive to, it's often connected with Navajo weaving. And um, I'm from New Mexico and I have some Navajo weavers who are friends and probably some of them are here. And so they can jump in and say if I'm saying this wrong, but um, lazy lines tends to be, have a negative connotation and it's often connected with Navajo weaving. And so they would appreciate it if we could call them something else like cutbacks, which I think is a great description. So. I apologize that that was part of the confusion, Jocelyn. Um, lazy lines and cutbacks are the exact same thing. So um, before we go, before I go, I will bring a different loom tomorrow, but I promise I will bring this one back out and show you how I'm doing. Um, so I could leave that in there. Let me just weave for a few more minutes and you all can, This is where maybe I'll, so I don't like here how this is starting to be, I went four steps by going over by two and this is gonna start to look like a straight, more of a straight line than I want. So I'm gonna move that one over one more. Sometimes you can beat stuff in just with your fingers. So here I'm, I've already completed a sequence there as I was demonstrating, so just keep that in mind. That's already done. And now I'm back up to where this white color is. Let's do that one again. This is, there are moments where, I'm sure you all experienced this, where you make a decision, I wanted to change that curve a little steeper, but I'm going to end up going away from my line here. And that's okay, because these lines are, um, they're not connected to anything. It's not like it has to look like something specific. So I just want to get to a place where I can outline that. Um, so I would finish this curve up and then that thing I was showing you on today's Sunday, Friday is doing, um, an eccentric outline. So because I did all of this with one bobbin, this all should be in the same shed and it looks like it is. So that's called an eccentric outline, what I just did, where I'm putting, um, putting in, it's eccentric or eccentric. I heard the peanut gallery upstairs say, thank you. Eccentric is how you say the word, but I've always said eccentric and I know it bothers some people. Um, I am putting in this line, which is not following the perpendicular. It's following the curve. And I'm doing that because I want to put in some silk. 
And this one was the pink orange one I talked about before. You can't really see where the orange, that there's orange in there, but am I right? Nope. I think this was the pink orange one. So I have pink and let's try these two colors of red. I'll just show you this and then y'all can keep weaving if you want to show everybody what you are weaving use the hashtag that is up here maybe and pop the um, images of what you're doing into Instagram or Twitter or if you use Ravelry, there's a really great group there and I recommend you go there. It's called Tapestry Weaving. Or of course, if you're in my Facebook group, you can show us what you're weaving there. So this is, I put, um, I put that silk right in the same shed as this one strand of that. That's called a split weft outline and that's what makes it look so smooth. I talk about that in the Warp and Weft class. Um, maybe in the Little Looms class, I'm not actually sure. But because this weft bundle is thin enough, um, I, can, I can do that. If I had two full pieces of yarn weft in there and I put two in the same shed, you would see a lot of lice. But this um, weft is very thin. It's too thin for this shed, actually. It's okay for a small distance, but... I can do that split weft. I'm actually just going to weave two sequences like this eccentrically or eccentrically if you are married to me. Um, and see how I'm sort of pulling that in, making sure that there's enough bubbling with that weft that weft has to travel a lot farther ways to go over and under each of those warps and then we'll bring it back to a different spot i want that to be a little bit pointy so i'm not going all the way up to the top and then i might end it there i could splice these silks but i'm not going to because they're so thin, I know that I can just needle them in later and it will be simple. And then I, if I were doing another split weft outline here at the top, if I want it to be really smooth, again, this is in the same shed as the last silk was. And then I can shift the shed and start a new butterfly weaving here and fill all of this in like this until I get up to that next curve. Of course, I am doing hatching, so I'll have to figure out how to add the other butterflies so that they are hatched together. So hopefully that helps. I don't know how it has been 45 minutes since I started this and apparently I'm incapable of only talking for 15 minutes. Um, Kate is asking, oh, sequence versus pass. Um, Kate, a pass and a sequence are the same thing, but in some of my early videos, um, I'm using pass in two different ways. In the book I just wrote, I've clarified all of this in my mind. A sequence and a pass are the same thing for most tapestry weavers. So when people talk about half pass, they mean a pick. Um, so I try to use the word sequence, which is two picks. So it's there and back again, if you like Tolkien. And um, a pick is, is just one, like you would have a pick if you're weaving fabric. A pass is the same as a sequence. A half pass is the same as a pick. Um, thanks, Shishi. I'm glad it's helpful. Um, yeah, so Kathleen asked tomorrow if you're in the design solutions class, which I did open up again if anybody um, now has more time and wants to jump in. 
There's a few open spots in the design solutions class, but Kathleen is asking, am I, I have a, Q, a live Q&A scheduled tomorrow for that class. And yes, I will be doing that. I think it's at 5 p.m. Mountain. I will be doing this in the morning also. So I will be here tomorrow. Um, ah, good question, Catherine. Um, yep, yeah, I'll go from here and I will start waving back and forth. So if this were, I'll just show you real quick. Um, I might even do this. Sometimes I'll weave down like that. And then I'm gonna start weaving perpendicular. So I'm filling it in going back and forth. I don't wanna fill it in going eccentrically because um, that will start to make my fabric warp. Thanks you all. Um, yeah, so Audrey asked, this looks thicker. It will pack down to look just like that. I put the exact same amount of weft in this one as I did in this one. So you'll see next time you see this, that this is packed down and it will look like this. Um, yeah, Lisa, oh, someone else asked about my book release. Oh no, that was for the q and I'm gonna get things really confused, you guys. Um, the live Q&A, uh, I, I had a question about my book. My book is released in October, October 27 of 2020. The book that I just mentioned that I had to clarify all my thinking about my teaching when I wrote the book. So it will be out with story publishing in October, as far as we know. Um, of course, they are, you, who knows these days how um, the printing will be impacted. But as far as I know, it will be out in October. Um, so I'll see you guys tomorrow. Please, um, please keep weaving and have a great day. It's Sunday. So maybe go outside if it's nice where you are. Um, jump online and do some yoga if you're not somewhere nice. And uh, keep weaving and show us what you're weaving. And um, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate you all coming.